So uh, today's lecture is going to be about uh, intellectual property rights or IP or patents and stuff. So we'll start you off by trying to get a bit of dialogue going and an open question of how can we protect our businesses from competition? So can I have a go ahead? Uh, by patent the core concept of the idea. Okay. And that will do what? What will that do? That will ensure that in some years we will have the advantages of, uh, of that technology, um, depending on the type of uh, but, uh, Okay, so patenting to, to keep the advantage of the particular technology. Any other way we can stay ahead? Go ahead. Protect your branding by trademark. Protect your branding by trademark. Good, so nobody else can trade off your brand name. Any other suggestions? At the back? Uh, maybe some people come to copy, so all the competition must be coming. Okay. In, in what sense? In a, making it, the product hard to replicate? Yeah. Maybe nanotechnology will be sure they wouldn't want to have the technology. Okay, yeah, that's a good suggestion. Any other ways? Go ahead. Copyright issues. Copyright. That's another way, quite similar to trademarking, we'll get onto that in a moment. Any other way we can secure our business from its competition to make sure our, our competition can't take our market position or our market share? Fast innovation. <coughs> so if you are so fast on the next product, so the competitor can cover your last product before you are on the next one. That's very good, yeah. So quite a lot of uh, high-tech firms will, will rely on this strategy, making sure that they're always five years ahead in terms of competence and knowledge than uh, their nearest competitors so that they can always move on to the next innovation quite quickly and rapidly. Even as cheap as possible, so the competition doesn't see the, the big potential. Okay. <coughs> okay. Do you think that might be reducing the margins then? So there's a bit of conflict there, I guess, between how much you can make on it and... Uh, um, but yeah, good point. Uh, there's a, one more. Go ahead. Have a monopoly. Have a monopoly. <laughs> but how do you create the monopoly? <laughs> that is the one. That's the last one, really. Uh, to be first to the market as one of the best strategies for protecting your business. So as soon as your name gets associated with that particular product or that particular market, that's a very good way of deterring competition because you get a, a slight monopoly on it because you're first to market. Okay, so some of the things you can expect from intellectual property rights are you get the recognition. So some people aren't really interested in making the money from it. They just want uh, to be recognised with the fact that they are the inventors or they, they were the creative people who came up with the, the trademark in the first place. Um, they give the owner uh, intellectual property rights to exploit uh, their technology or their design. They create uh, for the original a system which they can uh, benefit in terms of uh, monetary. And uh, you can treat the IPR as a currency. So. You don't really need to keep hold of it or exploit it yourself. You can license it out to other people or sell it to other firms or companies. So which is the most valuable form of IPR? Anyone have an opinion on that? Go ahead. Trademark. Trademark. And why do you say that? It's been proven. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well... The, the stat here would go to support that from Kodak, uh, saying that in 2001 their brand value was coming out at 14.8 billion, whereas their current patent portfolio is only uh, 3 billion. And of course the brand value is associated with the trademark. Um, and if you think about Apple, um, their patents will, will come and go in the sense that new technology will be developed, which renders the old patents and technology worthless or, or of less worth. 
The same with the uh, registered designs, so how the products appear. Um, I remember about 10 years ago, iPod, you, you just assumed that the main feature was the polished surface. You could say the circular dial as well, uh, but the polished surface and the white plastic housing, that resembled I, uh, Apple to me. Um, I, I guess most of you thought the same as well. And it was quite a shock, I thought, when Apple decided, no, we don't want to do polished surfaces anymore. We're such a good brand identity. We have such value in our trademark, in our Apple brand, and we have such faith in our technology that we can move into other products. We can move into different styles. So also the registered designs also come and go with the trends. So I'd probably agree, as long as you can get a reputation, the trademark is perhaps the most valuable thing. But of course, if you have no reputation, it's pretty much worthless. And therefore, if you have no reputation, perhaps patents are some of the only ways you can protect your current position. Go at the back. I'm just curious, would you have any brand value of Cobra today? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I should have mentioned. I would assume it's increased a lot. Uh, well, I think it's over, isn't it? It's gone bankrupt. So yeah. I'm not sure if it's got any, any brand value now that the company's gone under. Um, yeah, good point. So I was supposed to mention that. <laughs> uh, so we've got a, a taxonomy of how the different intellectual property rights relate to each other here. So some are about uh, being creative to, um, to acknowledge the, uh, the creative performance of the originator and the others are about rep um, reputation. So if we look on the reputation side, that's about the trademark and the unregistered trademark. So intellectual property rights can either be inherent in other words, as soon as you come up with your, your piece of artwork or your new technology or your invention, they're already protected, which is the inherent side, or some other forms of intellectual property you have to register or be approved. And one of the reasons for approval is you have to demonstrate its novelty. So on the trademark front, you can have a registered trademark or you can have an unregistered trademark. In other words, when you produce your design, it can still be protected or it still has some protection rights and it's protected against what's called passing off, which we'll come to in a moment. In terms of protecting creativity, your, your creative outputs, you have patents, registered designs, copyrights. You don't normally register copyrights, but you can do. Um, and in terms of inherent creative uh, IPR, you have copyright and design rights. So we'll go through each one of those individually. So first of all, registered design. Does anyone recognize this bottle here? Anyone tell me which, which brand or product this is associated with? Is it just too obvious that everyone knows? Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, of course. Um, so this is what a, a typical registered design is. And Coca-Cola have a, a number of uh, registered designs. But the important thing is, it's to do with both 2D and 3D. So first of all, the design must be new. It must be different from the current paradigm to a certain degree. So what was there before, it has to be distinctly different from. It covers appearance resulting from lines, contours, colors, shapes, texture, materials. There are two exceptions, must fit and must match. Anyone think what this might mean? So if it's protecting the shape of a physical product, are there any exceptions? Well, if you're uh, producing a design which must fit, such as um, something that must fit into a, a plug socket, you can't patent the bit that fits into the plug socket because that's not seen as fair other products must be able to produce something that can integrate with other products. So any of the kind of functional surfaces which integrate with other products or, or interferences cannot be uh, included in a registered design. So those, that counts for all standard connections and fittings, etc. It covers two or three dimensional objects. And in terms of duration, 
It lasts for five years, but then requires a renewal. And you can keep renewing it every five years for a 25-year period. And what do you get from a registered design? Well, it provides exclusivity. In other words, nobody else is allowed to produce any products using your registered design without your licensing or say-so. Now, in terms of unregistered designs, this comes automatically. So as soon as you've produced your uh, product in a tangible form, it cannot be in a manipulating form. So you can't have a CAD drawing, for example. It has to either be PDF'd, printed on a hard copy, or actually made into a tangible object. It must be original. If it's produced by an employee, it's owned by the employer. And I think that's the same for the, um, uh, the registered design as well. It only lasts for three years in the EU. In the UK, it's 15 years. and other countries, it's also different values. Um, the exclu um, owner has exclusive rights to the product. And where the product is larger um, or is much more complex, you may decide to just register the design of a particular subsection of the design. And you can only do that if that part of the design is visible during normal operation. So you can't, um, you can't register the design of the underside of a casing of a mobile phone, for example, because most of the time people can't see it or know it exists. So it has to be visible during normal operation. Um, and the big difference between an unregistered design and a registered design is it doesn't protect, an unregistered design doesn't protect against independently produced designs. So in other words, I could come up with a, a nice sketch for how to produce some packaging and some court somewhere when I, I claim that somebody else has infringed on my design could say, well, this other person who infringed on it didn't actually copy your design. They came up with it independently. So when you have a, if they, they can prove that, or if there's good reason to believe they came up with it independently and didn't copy you, you have no rights when it's an unregistered design. Whereas if I register the design, it doesn't matter whether somebody else copied me or not. The fact that their design is too similar to mine prevents them from being able to use it. So that's a big reason why you want to register your design. Now, trademarks. This costs, these cost about 900 euros if you file it online. They're not very expensive. And this is for an EU trademark. Um, we're quite lucky in the EU in the sense that if you want to trademark in independent countries, it, it probably comes out at getting on towards 200 euros per country. But you can do an EU collective trademark which comes out about 900 euros, um, and it's worth doing. Just so you know, the symbol for a registered trademark is this R in a circle. The unregistered version of the trademark is the TM. And I think in the US, you can also get this service mark, and that's what SM means. So I'll just quickly show you how you'd go about trademarking. Let's see if the internet's on. while it's loading up. You can go onto this OHIM. I think there's other places you can register your trademark with, but uh, um, I'd recommend this one. Am I connected? Okay, so here's how you file the trademark online. You simply go to the OHIM website, the, the links are in the presentation, and you can either file a trademark or a registered design on this website. So this isn't for patenting, this is for the alternative means of protection. You can choose the language. Uh, I think I'm gonna give this a skip. Seems to be taking too long. But one, 
just take it from me, it's not particularly difficult to register a trademark. It's quite explanatory, all the rules are there. So as long as you get onto this, put apply, some of the things you have to do are select the area in which you want to register your trademark. So you have to register it in a particular service area or goods area. So it has to be registered for the alcohol industry or the food and drink industry or the transport industry and so on and so on. And you have to be a little bit clever about where you select your trademark to be positioned. You have a trademark. Do you have to put it on your package so you have a trademark or...? Um, I don't think so. Um, I'll, I'll check that out for you, but I don't think you do. Um, for example, um, well, Apple never really put their registered design stamp uh, their are with a circle next to their logos or products, but obviously they are trademarked. So I, I don't think you do have to. But it's relatively easy to find out where trademarks are. You, you simply go to this second link here to search for a trademark, and you can just type in the name of the trademark or the number if you have it, such as this is a a trademark myself and my friend produced. Um, and then it just comes up with, as you can see here, there's a, a classification number, number 33, um, the list of goods and services which it's associated with, which is alcoholic beverages, um, excluding beers. Um, now, if you're to use this trademark, I believe outside of that area, it, it's okay, you're not infringing on the trademark. Um, and basically, before you decide to produce your domain name or your trademark, go into this, um, uh, this system, search, see if it already exists, and then decide whether or not you perhaps want to license it out or change your name. Okay, the things that you can trademark, it's normally used for words. So your, the name of your company you will normally trademark or the product, but you can also uh, trademark sounds, smells, um, containers or packaging and so on. It should be distinctive, not a laudatory term. Now what this means is you cannot patent, um, sorry, you cannot trademark something which is a term which describes the product. So it has to be fanciful. So you couldn't, um, you couldn't trademark a drink by the name of soda or, or plum drink, something like that. It would have to be, um, well, a bit like something like Shopify, for example. It's got to have the if I on the end to make it, it can't be shopping. You can't trademark shopping. You have to have it in some way fanciful. Um, or can be completely gobbledygook word, um, such as, I can't think of one off the top of my mind, but perhaps Mars or so on. Uh, it must not be deceptive. So in other words, it can't promise the user they're getting something else. It must not cause confusion from previous trademarks. It lasts for 10 years, but is renewable and it can be revoked. So some examples of trademark, we can have the Coca-Cola bottle, the Chanel perfume bottle, and you'll notice here that you can also trademark and register certain designs. Um, uh, the song, Bass Air Orange Restring or Sonnet. Uh, even the colour orange on these uh, Friskars scissors. So you can't produce scissors with this colour orange handle because it's seen as specific to this brand of scissor. So that's encapsulated in the trademark. The sound of a dog barking, I don't know where that came from. Um, the slogan, exceedingly good cakes. Has anybody heard of this slogan before? Okay, this is a bit colloquial. This is something in Britain. Everybody knows exceedingly good cakes as with Mr. Kipling. Um, and also <coughs> domain names. So a little bit of trivia. The Guinness trademark, one of the most iconic brands. Can anyone tell me what's trademarked about Guinness or the Guinness brand? So when you have a, a can of Guinness, what is trademarked there? What aren't you allowed to use? I'm guessing the heart. Yep. Uh, the color. 
No. Like the, the, uh, maybe that could have the ball inside the, the cap. Well, that could be patented. I, I don't think it's, uh, it would be trademarked. Okay. Um, and the name, obviously. Yep. The letter, the typeface, yeah. and the Guinness name. And there's one more. The Arthur Guinness signature. So those are the three things that Guinness see as a primary to their brand image and the things that they trademark. You'll see some trademark disputes. So Apple and Apple. Uh, Apple was the record company. Um, Apple Corps was the record company that uh, was assigned to the Beatles. Um, and they've been having long running disputes with Apple Electronics. Um, there's a little story here about in 1981, they reached a settlement where Apple Electronics was infringing on Apple Corpse's uh, trademark and they settled at a mere $80,000. But when you actually look into this case a little bit more, one of the conditions of the settlement were Apple computers agreed to not enter the music business um, and Apple Corps agreed not to enter the computer business. So it was a small settlement. It was supposed to reach a lot higher than that, but Apple Corps did very well out of it because they decided Apple electronics were not allowed to enter the music business. Of course, we know history panned out slightly differently. So in 91, they had to reach another settlement after Apple Electronics' business went in a slightly different direction. They came up with another settlement of 26 million and then eventually decided to come up with a new agreement where Apple were allowed to go into the music business, but they were only allowed to distribute it through the electronic media. They weren't allowed to produce music on hard form. So that, and this is typical of trademarking, working out what you have exclusive rights to and what you don't. So moving on from trademarking to copywriting, Copywriting is inherent, but it can be registered. In other words, as soon as you produce your design, um, your logo, whatever, it is copyrighted. Um, or your piece of art. Or It's generally, by the way, copywriting covers artwork or art forms in general. It springs to life as soon as it's creative, it created. It belongs to the person creating the work. If the author is an employee, however, it belongs to the employer. Ownership can be assigned or licensed. It's for all forms of artwork, pretty much, um, and prevents copying, distributing, adapting, reproducing without royalty. So if you want to produce a cover track of somebody else's music, I think nobody can stop you from doing that, but you have to pay the original artist a standard royalty, and that differs depending on which business you're in. Um, if you're in the drug discovery business, standard royalties can be up to 10%. Generally speaking, for registered design, registered copyright, it's up to 2% royalties. So the lifetimes of copyrights, well, for literary, literary, musical, artistic, it's up to 70 years plus. Uh, films, TV, radio, 50 years and publishers' rights, 25 years. Here's an example which is close to home, The Little Mermaid, not the Disney version, but the uh, other Little Mermaid, which I wouldn't dare put on a uh, presentation through fear of litigation. Um, but basically, you cannot uh, replicate any form of The Little Mermaid as associated with the Copenhagen version of The Little Mermaid without uh, the family of the original creator coming down and uh, charging you for copyright. And there's been several cases in the past in different towns of people replicating the Little Mermaid statue um, and they will eventually be tracked down and charged uh, from not the original, uh, the originator, but their family because copyright of these, these works of art lasts for so long. I think they only have about 15 years left on it though. A story of champagne and cheddar. So there are not just the, the forms of copyright that I've exposed to you just a moment ago, um, but also other smaller forms of copyright like uh, these badge of origination. 
So champagne, champagne can only be produced or named champagne if it comes from this particular region of France, which is known as champagne. If it doesn't come from there, it just has to be sparkling white wine. Cheddar, unfortunately, uh, uh, has everyone heard of cheddar cheese? Okay. So it's, it's, I think it's the most popular brand of cheese in the UK, and I think it's one of, if not the most popular brand of cheese in the US. Um, I think mozzarella is a little bit more popular in some areas. But basically, cheddar is a small area about here in the United Kingdom, a very small village which produced cheddar cheese. And unfortunately, they didn't get any prote protection on it at all. So anybody in the world can produce cheddar cheese um, and call it cheddar because they didn't get protection to begin with. Now they call it, uh, they have a badge for protected origination for West Country cheddar which is cheddar produced from this area, and nobody can call cheddar West Country cheddar unless it is produced from these four counties. So they kind of really missed out. Most of the French cheeses are all uh, protected by their um, origin, but unfortunately, cheddar missed the boat on it. Then in addition to the, the previous registered kind of restrictive forms of copyrights, we have the Creative Commons license. And I'll just go through these quickly because I've already introduced you to them. This basically makes sure the originator of the artwork or the, uh, the creative uh, form gets recognition for it. So all you have to do to register is stick this stamp on. BY means it's by this person. So this is attribution. So if you stick this on your work, anybody can print it, send it out, modify it, do whatever they want with it, as long as they reference you. Then you can have this buy and share alike version. Uh, I put a star next to it because this is the one uh, we use for this course, meaning anyone can take this, modify it, uh, and rebrand it as their own, but as long as they, they give right, um, some recognition to the originator. Then there is this non-derivatives version. So this is basically saying anyone can take it and reproduce it, but you're not allowed any derivatives of it. You have to reproduce it exactly the same as I'd originally planned. And the purpose for doing this is you perhaps don't want your name associated with other forms of your origination. So let's say you come up with a, a beautiful painting. You don't want somebody messing with it and having your name attached to this this monstrosity which they've, they've destroyed. So that kind of protects um, uh, the, the author's association with a particular artwork. And then there are various other forms of this which also include um, non-commercial. So some things you can distribute for general use but as long as they're not used to gain uh, money from. So just a quick quiz to finish with. Uh, which of the following could not uh, meet the criteria for a registered design? A portable CD player, a rubber ceiling ring for the door of a washing machine, a toilet disinfectant cleaner packaging, or a corkscrew? And why do you say that? So what about the Alessi corkscrew? With the, have you seen those Alessi corkscrews? With the, okay. You can get various artistic forms of different corkscrews, um, but I, I take your point. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, as a portable CD player, it's kind of a, a system where you get to have different designs for the three others, I suppose. Different types of, different types of It's not the portable CD player. <laughs> I can see this lecture has been very effective. <laughs> um, no, you can produce the portable CD player in pretty much any form you want. I mean, of course, it has to have um, the CD interface with it, but it can be a cube, it can be uh, Maltese shaped, it can be whatever you like. Um, both the rubber ceiling and the corkscrew is uh, must fit, isn't it? Must fit fitting. That's right. The rubber ceiling, generally speaking, will be covered by must fit. 
So it has to be a particular size to interface with another product. Um, and you're, you're right in a certain sense, perhaps you could argue that the head of a corkscrew cannot be covered because it has to interface with the bottle, but the rest of it can. The rubber seal would be completely covered by the, the must fit or must interface with. And the other question, um, which of the following can be registered as a trademark? A brand name, uh, the shape of a container, a smell, a domain name, a color. Yeah, it's all of them. Okay, so we'll have a, a 15 minute break now before some questions and then uh, Verena Simpson will be coming to, to deal with the patency side of it. This is just the alternative forms of uh, um, protecting. But first of all, any questions? Go ahead. Have you got something in mind? Yeah, it's not a thing in furniture, uh, on the police, uh, and, uh, <coughs> yeah. I know the, the Arnie Jacobson chairs are, yeah. were registered designs. Um, but you can, you can, I think you are... I they, think I know what you're talking about. They make them in, in the UK, but yeah. you cannot import them to Denmark it's because there's different rules in the UK and Denmark. With, with how many years after the, the designer has passed away? And then, like, it's a ridiculous amount of years, like 70 or 75 years, and the UK is a bit shorter. So they can produce it in the UK legally. And as the UK is a part of the, the European Union, you can legally buy copy furniture in the UK because it's under UK legislation. But in Denmark, you're not allowed to sell them or pass them on to anybody else because that's illegal because then you're selling a copy furniture. But you can buy it legally, but you can't sell it out. I might start a little black market in uh, Denmark with Aunt Jacobs and Jairs. Now that's a very good point. I only heard that story recently as well. Uh, just one question about uh, if it only lasts for 25 years, but Coca-Cola has been around for more than 100 years. Do they, do they renew their license by slightly changing the design? Um, that's, that's a that's a very good question. Yeah, I don't know, because it's, it's way over 25 years old. Um, it may be protected by copyright as well, um, which gives it a little bit more time. I don't know. I'll, I'll have a little look into that. I don't know why that's allowed to uh, extend, um, but I'll get back to you. Nine different Guinness logos. Yeah. And nine slightly different signatures. Exactly. So can they can they produce a slight variant and then get a copyright on that? Maybe so. Maybe Verena knows. <laughs> Straight interactions. Do you know why Coca Cola <coughs> trademark uh, can last so many years? You know, why is it allowed to be on be beyond twenty five year period? Yeah, I'll have to look it up as well. <laughs> okay. When you register uh, trademark in Denmark, you normally would sign up for three different areas. Uh, but in your example, you only have to register one area. You only have to register one, but you also have the option to register secondary areas. So if you go onto the community trademark or the EU-wise trademark, you can register subsidiary areas. I'm not sure what rights they give you in those different areas, uh, but I think it's more so that people can find you through the searching. Um, but you can register other areas as well. Also, if you pay more, are you then able to get uh, more areas? I think that's, that is an option on the community trademark as well. Can you uh, trademark software in the same way as... Uh, um, I don't, it's not trademarking. Well, you can trademark the brand name of software, but I, I th and I'm not sure what the patency is with software. 
but I know you can register, register a design of the code. Um, I think that's right, is that right? Well, we'll come to it later, apparently. <laughs> we have the resident expert in. But I think that copyright must be many, many years. I mean, just to give you an example, my father wrote a book and I still get fees for his mum after he died. Well, apparently copyright is 70, uh, yeah. at least 70 years. But I, th I think Coca-Cola has been a, a brand for over 70 years, hasn't it? So I wonder what exception they have. I'll, I'll do some research and find it out. Okay, do we have any more questions? Okay, well, we'll take a, uh, a break now. And if we can be back by 20 past, um, so just under 15 minutes break. <laughs>